All right, let's talk about some mythology. So when it comes to mythology, the most famous one is group mythology. Unless you can't, don't count every religion as mythology, which I do. But that's beside the point. Anyway, there's plenty of millions of stories that happen in the Greek pantheos. But one of the most famous is the story of Heracles. Yes, Heracles, not Hercules. Anyway, I'll give you a brief rundown on what the original story was. So Zeus, he, he liked to get around. Round, round, get around. He, get, he got around. He cheated on his wife Hera multiple times. And one of them was with a uh, common woman, who I don't know the name of, it doesn't really matter. And they had a child, who they named something. But to appease the gods later, he was changed to appease Hera to Heracles. That's where he gets his name from. Anyway, he gets married, and he has a lovely wife named Megara. And then Hera's like, you know what, I really hate Hercules, so I'm going to make him go mad and kill his wife and kids. So Hercules thinks he kills his wife and kids, and he goes crazy. And he's like, how, what, how can I appease the gods? Like, do 12 labors. Actually, 10 labors is one guy. He doesn't count two of them, so he has to do 12 of them. And he does a bunch of different missions, and each one are supposed to be impossible, but due to his strength and cleverness, Her Heracles overcomes the odds. He also has his wang out all the time. If you couldn't, I, the reason I mentioned this because finding a picture of him depicted that doesn't have his, a little, uh, his little peewee out is very hard to find. Some of these... Fate, fates include, include killing the Nemenian lion, which he then wears for the rest of the series, with a club, by the way. He kills everything with clubs. De defeating the Hydra by burning the tips of his head. Taming her Hades' uh, pet, Cerberus, which you can see depicted here. As well as cleaning stables. Uh, one of those is not like the others. And yeah, eventually, he is able to become accepted with the rest of the gods and become a main one, where he becomes the god of strength, and he also protects the temple not the temple, the uh, Mount Olympus, in case you're wondering, from Outsiders. He's a really cool guy. He's a, br he's a brooding hero who redeems himself, even though he didn't do anything bad in the first place. He was forced to, to kill his wife because of Hera. But it's okay, because he showcases what, how to overcome mighty obstacles using wit, cleverness, and outwitting your evil enemies. If you haven't been watching my series all the way through, which you probably should, this is not the first time Disney's a tackle to Greek mythology. Back in Fantasia, there was a short dedicated entirely around characters in the Greek mythology law land, or whatever you like to say it. I can't speak sometimes, unfortunately. Speaking of which, there's actually controversy over this film. In Greece, they did not like the fact that Disney changed so much of the original tale, saying it's they're destroying our culture like people always do for our Greek mythology. So they gave it a subtitle like Beyond the Myth to make it clear that this is not really an adaptation of Hercules. And I could discuss every inaccuracy, but it's pretty obvious that they doesn't follow much of anything. There's a whole video that dissects everything that gets wrong with mythology, so how you're going to go searching that one out for yourself. Oh, in case you're wondering, this is actually not a Hercules adaptation. This is a Superman adaptation. I'm not even joking about that. So you're probably wondering, what do you mean, Superman? Doesn't Disney own Marvel, not DC? Well, yeah, but here's an example. So Superman is a character who is an alien who goes to Earth, crashes down, he's adopted by two people who find him. He is dif different from the re everyone else because he has superhuman strength. He realizes that he's actually from a beings that are far above everyone else. And he goes out to seek a new purpose, a new life. And he goes out and defeats monsters, and eventually his Achilles heel becomes a person that he falls in love with, for the most part, this green rock man. So yeah, does that sound very similar to the Hercules movie we were watching? Because in this, Hercules is discovered by two people after falling down from the sky after being kidnapped, in this version. His superhuman strength makes him ostracized from the rest of the, the, his peers as well as other people in the village. He then goes out to make a name for himself and save the day where he does heroic feats and is loved by everybody. Everybody except a villain who uses a secret weapon that he's weak to against him. And he falls in love with a sassy brunette. And this isn't the first time that Superman's ever gave up his powers to help somebody else, so that's also on the checklist. So yeah, it's pretty clear that they are trying to adapt this guy, not the actual Hercules or Heracles from the myth. Now that's not a bad thing, however this film at least a little bit to be desired to be honest. And don't get me wrong, Hercules is a fun film. There's plenty of fun things, the animation's great as always, and the songs are good. But there's a little bit of shallowness to this film compared to the other previous Renaissance films, except for Pocahontas, obviously. I would say up to the Zero to Hero sequence, the film goes relatively smooth, and there's no major problems or issues. But around the halfway mark, this film kind of falls a little flat for me. Despite it wanting to be a Superman story, it's more of a musical comedy, more on the comedic side, which is fine, but it doesn't, film doesn't feel like it knows what it really wants to be. So it feels like it just uses the comedy as a clutch for not having that great of writing. 
For example, all of the major feats that he does in the actual myth are in one song sequence that go over so quick you don't even know they happen. Which means all that Hercules does in the rest of the film is whine and bitch like a little baby because he can't be a true god or something like that. And then in the final battle, which feels like it lasts 10 minutes, all the Greek gods are immediately in prison and then immediately freed by Hercules who destroys them all in a time span of 10 minutes. It feels incredibly anticlimactic after all this set up for this scene that just ends in less than 10 minutes. But we don't know that much about the Greek gods in this universe. We barely see any of them other than Hercules and Hades. They seem so fucking weak during this one scene. Which, even if you don't have knowledge of Greek mythology, it just feels really dumb. Especially since, well, they already defeated these guys before, but they get immediately defeated now, like chump. Though as soon as he's free, they immediately start beating them up easily, which happens in a very short time span. And then he's like, well that finale sucks, well here's the real finale, you gotta follow me to the underworld, bitch. So what should have been a pretty cool epic battle between everybody, it's just a very lame five minutes with just lame jokes in between. Where uh, Hercules tames his dog here, which would have been cool, but you know. So Hades uses these two pathetic minions called Pain and Panic, which are in Greek mythology the whole time. However, in this movie, and Greek mythology, he has a giant three-headed dog the whole time who just stays in the underworld. It's not like he cares about running it that much, because clearly the whole time in this movie, he's just doing fucking Hercules the whole time, but whatever. This, maybe this won't bother anyone else, but since I'm a big fan of Cerberus, I'm pissed off that he's barely used. Also, especially seeing that it's one of the main labors of Hercules! Speaking of which, Hercules is actually a pretty fun character at the beginning of the movie. When he's voiced by uh, Josh Keen, who is the best Spiron voice actor. He gives a really great performance that really sells his character as kind of an outcast who wants to do a lot more and wants to prove himself. And you really feel it. But once he's grown up, which is most of the movie, he becomes bland and boring. Like, there's nothing to this guy. Like, all that insecurity stuff is pretty much gone for the most part. He's just very lame. He likes Meg, but that's not a much of a tar character point there. His trainer, Philocides, or Phil, I didn't even know if he said that right, who cares, he also kind of sucks. And honestly, if he wasn't voiced by Danny DeVito, his character would probably even worse than he already is. He's not an awful character, but he's a character that I just don't care for. And we're supposed to care about him wanting people to brag about him raising a hero, which is... Who the fuck gives a shit about that? He's a grumpy old satyr who's voiced by Danny DeVito. And it feels like, well, they got Danny DeVito involved, so they don't have to write any funny lines for him. So he just comes off as annoying and self-centered. You don't really feel like he gives a shit about anything but his ego, so you don't really like this character. So my problem is the two main characters I feel are doing stuff more out of selfishness rather than selflessness, even though if they try to imply it is, I just don't feel it that well. And what that does is actually makes the main villain look more interesting and more compelling, which is what's the saving highlight of this film. And if everyone knows this film, the highlight is Hades. Now let's get out of the way first. Hades has never been a villain in Greek mythology, and I think everyone knows that. And it's not the only film that gets, makes that mistake, but I thought I had to point that out. What sells this character is the design and the performance. This design is great. He has a fiery hair all at all times, and he gets angry and becomes red hot. And something about that, the fact he has control of his anger levels through his hair is pretty funny. His performance as like kind of like a business guy with a used car salesman type makes it even funnier. So he's a funny and yet compelling character. His motivation makes sense. He wants to take over the uh, Mount Olympus because his brother Jack asked him quite literally when he first meets him. He's like, I want to take it over because my hell here spot sucks ass. Who the fuck wants to roll over dead people? And he likes to make deals, which is more of a Satan trait than a Hades trait, but you know, whatever. He actually has a very interesting thing with the main ca uh, character's love interest, which is Megara, who dies in original mythology, in case you're wondering. In any other Disney movie, he would try like to put himself against her, like, yeah, you're mine now, like Jafar did, and what we saw Frollo do, but obviously that was an original book for that, Frollo. No, even though he's like a kind of a bad guy to her, he treats her like he's his gay, her gay best friend, which is kind of funny, actually. And funny enough, every deal he makes, it goes through. Like, he says, if you do this for me, I'll free you. And he doesn't go back on it. He actually frees her, her later on. And after his one deal of Hercules breaks, it also gives back his strength. So he's not a, he doesn't lie about his deal. That's not a high bar, however. Near the end of the movie, he makes a deal of Hercules. And Hercules doesn't live up to the bet, and he fucks him over. That's a dick move. He made a deal for you, bitch. You gotta follow the deal. Since these Greek gods are assholes who don't even interfere with the human world like Hades, who has a clear obviousness, can. I mean, why couldn't they go down there son if Hades can go down there? Whatever. These guys seem like selfish assholes, and they always have a weird glow around them, which I don't really understand the design concept around. It makes you think, maybe uh, Hades has a point. These guys seem like fucking jackasses. Fuck them. Also, they can't interact. As you see, Zeus strikes Phil here with a lightning bolt, so obviously he was lying about that. He'd rather be a giant statue, which is one of the only references for actual mythology that I see here. So I like the film for the most part, because there's a lot of flaws of it. Like the CGI on the Hydra here. 
Now, the reason this thing is CGI is because later on they're going to have multiple heads for it, but it looks very distracting. This effect did not hold up at all. I mean, it looks interesting when there's multiple heads, but early on when it doesn't only has one, it looks like absolute shit. Other than that is a fun fight scene, which is actually very few in this superhero-esque film. And of course, the only other redeeming quality about this film is Megar. I like how she starts in the villain side, but over time, Gross actually like Hercules in a very genuine way, even though he's a slab of wood, in my opinion. She's sassy, she's hot, what else do you want more for her? And she's with Hades most of the time, so it makes her even more interesting character. And her song's good. She is voiced by a Broadway actor who played Belle in the first Beating the Beast play stage show. So that's pretty cool to know. Unfortunately, she only gets one song. Most of the songs are sung by the Fates, who I'm not the biggest fan of because I'm not into gospel or the gospel sound of the film. Their songs are technically good, but they're not my cup of tea, per se. And honestly, that was Hercules. An entertaining, but ultimately kind of shallow Disney film. It has elements that you'd want to see in a Disney film, but it doesn't go above and beyond. It's a little bit too occupied with telling jokes that either are hit or miss in characters that are either flat or interesting. It does have one of my favorite Disney references, with the new meaning line being Scar from Lion King. That's a reference to Lion King's one throwaway line, as well as a mythology reference, so that's a cool reference all in one. But yeah, but for Blaine, Adult, Hercules, and Phil, this film probably would have been a lot better, in my opinion. But I can definitely see why someone would say this is their favorite film. For me, it just does the bare minimum. It's good, but very flawed. The movie was given a TV show, and it had a direct-to-video compilation of the episode, so I'm not counting Zero to Hero as an actual direct-to-video movie. So yeah, the show is about Hercules going to school, and yeah, that's mostly it. It did cross over Latin, as I mentioned in my Latin review, and that was kind of cool. So yeah, other than that one directed video movie, which is just a compilation of episodes, it's shocking that Hercules didn't actually have a sequel film, because uh, it definitely could have used one. Not like it could have used one, it could have had one, if you know what I mean. And apparently there is going to be, well, a remake of Hercules. Who knows? Uh, because it's been adapted many times, not just by Disney, they could go really any way they want, but it follows the movie where you know it's going to be shit, because live-action remakes are just always terrible. Don't know why, they just can't make them good. It's not that they ha don't have to make them good, they just choose not to make them good. In most of the other Disney movies, there's also a video game of Hercules on the PlayStation as well as PC. There's a Game Boy version, but obviously that one was different. And from what I heard, it's not bad at all. It uses a nice 2.5D art style here and looks pretty interesting. And here's what the Game Boy version looked like. Very different. And like a lot of other Disney movies we've seen at the time, there was an animated storybook as well. Lovely. So essentially, there was another Hercules game called Hades Challenge, where you're playing on the PC, and you try to figure out mini-games and figure out puzzles to stop Hades. Lovely. So I actually haven't talked about Kingdom Hearts for a reason because it's a long rabbit hole of stuff. But I gotta mention the Hercules one because uh, Mount Olympus is freezing in every Kingdom Hearts game and it's fucking annoying. You got this stupid F Phil who's even more annoying than he is in the movie. He's fucking annoying as hell. Gets in your way and complains you bitches at you all the time about stupid bullshit. And you just fight a mirage of enemies. I just don't like doing this. And they force you to do it every fucking game for some reason. It's annoying as hell. Like, get tired of seeing this fucking arena over and over again. Like, what's a true hero? Fuck you, I do more shit than you do, Hercules. Fuck you. Down, then my rant's over. Let's go on to the Disney parks. Does everyone remember Disney Quest? Well, Disney Quest was an area that was in Chicago as well as Disney Springs at uh, Walt Disney Studios, where it was kind of like a big indoor arcade, and it was supposed to be a long, big, like a smaller version of the Disney parks around different cities. It didn't end up doing very well, unfortunately. I actually liked the Disney Springs location. It actually was kind of cool. It had very unique stuff in there. It had a unique charm. I'm not sure if anyone knows how to describe it, but it did have a Hercules attraction there. It's the only one they can actually find from the Disney parks. Which is unfortunate. Actually, I did have a Latin one, which I probably should mention in my Latin review. But I'm going to show you a little uh, picture of what the Hercules one looks like, so you actually can't find a actual video of it. Oh man, I would love to see that Sid's toy creator. That was so cool to do. Oh, man, I, this area I miss so much. This is the only picture I could find, and it had pretty bad pre-rendered models. It was called Hercules in the Underworld, and it would have been like a little screen ride, like the other rides at the Disney Quest. I like Disney Quest personally, and I kind of miss it. But oh well. Anyway, we're on to the rankings. Hercules goes at the bottom of the B tier. It's almost a C tier movie, but it has a couple of redeeming things that make it watchable. It's enjoyable to watch. I just, I just get like tired out by the second half, which is a shame, because the first half I thought was pretty strong. Oh well. 
I put Hades in the S tier. He is almost not there because, like I said, the plan kind of fails in the end. But he's a very entertaining guy. And I don't know if his voice actor did anything questionable. I feel like he has, but who cares? The, the character is great. So yeah, S tier for him. So, here's the princess rank. We're adding Megara to the list because she is a princess. Because she's with Hercules, who is the prince of the Olympus. And he's a god, so would you count that? Yeah, she belongs to this category. She's a very fun character, and she helps make Hercules not a dull movie. I don't know what she sees in Wonder Boy, which takes her down a tier, to be honest. He, other than, he, he guess he's got big muscles. He's got a weird face, though. I mean, he doesn't even have his wang out like the statue of Hercules does. Oh, well. She is super hot, though. Like, geez, Louise, like, what were they doing to this character to make her so sultry? I, I, I can see, see why Hercules wants her. I just can't see why she would want Hercules. Oh, well. Alright, let's go to the song ranking. So our bottom tier we have C. Two songs that just do nothing for me, basically. One Last Hope is not a bad sequence, however, Danny DeVito, he can't sing, and they didn't get him a, like a voice replacement for his, sing his singing voice, so yeah. Uh, maybe it could have been better. There's also lame jokes in there, too, that makes it not as good. But other than that, it's fine, just nothing great. And the other C tier song is A Star Is Born, which is one of the most forgettable songs in any Disney movie ever. It, it really means nothing to me. It's not a very good ending number. It's, it's, it's eh. Eh. Then in B tier, we got the Gospel Truth, which has three sections to it. So each section has highlights, but for the most part, it's just an average, okay song. Nothing too spectacular for me. I can see someone else really liking it. But yeah, as well as Zero to Hero. You can see I'm not a big fan of the Gospel song. Zero to Hero is definitely the best one in terms of it. And that's the most going on in it, because we get to see him do all of his labors. Pretty much, which is kind of shocking, but oh well. Then in, we yeah, got nothing in A tier. Then in S tier, we got the two other songs. I want to say I'm in love because, you know, why wouldn't you want to say you're in love? Because love is a very complicated emotion. Especially if you want to be, be with a Wonder Boy who has the personality of a brick wall. You know what I mean? But Megara, you can do a lot better. You can go with me instead. Just kidding. I'm all ugly as hell. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> and I'm also taken, but you know. And the top of S tier, well not the top of S tier, just top for Hercules is Go the Distance, which I counted as repraising it because Disney counts it as one song on their their YouTube channel, so I'm going to count that part as a whole other song. And it's a very, it's a, it's a highlight of the movie. It's a greatly sung song. It's very passionate. It's the most charismatic Hercules is, is as a character, the most we, I feel for the character. You feel like you want to go the distance when you hear the song, and that is why it's an S tier. Thank you for watching, and the next film is Mulan. I will see you then.